Welcome to Positive Recovery MD. If you're listening, chances are you want to create happiness around you and thrive in your life. We're glad you're here and you've come to the right place. This podcast will inspire and motivate you to not merely survive your recovery journey, will give you the tools to build or strengthen your foundation to thrive and flourish in your life. Each week, we'll come together as a community to have authentic conversations around addiction, recovery, and what matters, growth and progress, not perfection, all while developing positive habits for you to utilize in your life. To learn more, please visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to receive the daily positive interventions that we'll review, as well as gain access to exclusive Positive Recovery content available only to Positive Recovery MD listeners. All right, let's get started. Hi, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another installment of Positive Recovery MD. We've got three co-hosts and a special guest today. So I'm Dr. Jason Powers, one of your co-hosts. We have George Joseph. Hey, guys. And Julie Denofa. Hey, hey. And today we have a special guest, Houston Icon. Doesn't like being in the spotlight, but we're going to put him in the spotlight for a few minutes here. Jeff Bagwell. Hey, Jeff. Welcome. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I I was at the game where the ceremony here in Houston, where they sort of, uh, it wasn't the induction to the Hall of Fame, but... Um, I, I loved your speech, man. I was like right behind first base. I was trying to get your attention. You don't know who I am. And um, <laughs> you said something like, I, you know, I don't like being in front of the mic. I, I would want to be out there with you guys. Of course, that would be funny or something. I'd make a fool of myself. And I, I get that, dude. It's like uh, our last guest had this uh, really great outlook on life. Like you either approach life with a hunger or a fear. And if you have a hunger, like that's all you want to do. You want to add to it. It's like going towards something and you, you do more than what's expected. And if you are motivated by fear, you just barely do enough to not get in trouble. And the way that you approach your career so far, and even as a coach after, and I'd love to hear what you're up to now, definitely was, was a hunger. You were offered a scholarship to University of Hartford, killed it. You like set records there, and the Boston Red Sox gave you, uh, drafted you, but you were, you were betting 333, which is pretty damn awesome, but only four home runs. Major League Baseball Hall of Fame website says that your story is so famous, it's a cautionary tale for every big league general manager because we got you for a dream, you know, that we get, we got rid of some reliever and we got you who like you got from the first moment you set on the field. And by the way, you were a third baseman, happy to play first, but man, you, you got rookie of the year. One year you were like unanimous as an MVP, right? Yep. Crazy. Uh, like, your, the records that he has set is just, it's beyond words. And, and I'm gonna, not going to go over it because it's he might vomit, but you guys can definitely read about it. So, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. This website has two purposes. One, to offer people hope. And sometimes the person's in recovery, like my last guest uh, wasn't, but he embodies the character strength, the perseverance and grit. Dr. Kara, I can't wait for that podcast to drop. He's really awesome. Uh, so some people are in recovery, some people aren't, but we like to give people hope and we also like to give people a tool to flourish in recovery, in life, at work, wherever. So those of our listeners that don't know you. I guess the first thing I would say is I'm I'm Jeff and I'm an alcoholic. You know, I I think what you said about hope is a big thing. I think that's a lot of of times that when we're in our disease, you kind of lose that. Um, And for me, it was, I I felt like I had no purpose in life. I, I would, I finished my career kind of, in 2006, sitting in my living room at 2.30 going, what am I doing? Like, I have no purpose. For so long, I had one thing, and that was to play baseball. Uh, I had two kids at the time, which were great, and that was wonderful and all that. But for myself personally, I just didn't have enough for me, enough substance of who I was. And I still feel that way today a little bit as far as, you know, baseball was my job, and I did have a passion for it. And I was relatively good at it. But because of I'm not gifted with, you know, I'm not six to, you know, 220 pounds hitting home runs since I came out of my mother. That just isn't that wasn't the way it was. I had to use my mind in order to be better than most. And you try and use your mind to realize that you're an alcoholic. It's a uh, it's a really tough thing to wrap your arms around. And it became an obstacle for me. And, you know, the constant uh, constant effort of trying to stay sober was very difficult for me because I I was like, you're going to tell me that I, I can't drink like a normal person. 
I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I've hit the best pitchers in baseball. I've done all these kind of things. And, you know, it took me probably seven full years of getting my, you know, face kicked in the dirt every single time to realize that I couldn't. My father, when I was a kid, also used to instill in me, don't ever quit. If you ever do any, if you ever start something, don't ever quit. You know, I worked at Friendlies one time when I was in college for baseball league. If there's one thing I should have quit, that was being a dishwasher at Friendlies. That was whole. <laughs> but I didn't because my dad said that. So here I come after I'm finished playing and I'm in my addiction and I'm looking at it as I'm quitting. And it wasn't until finally that I realized that you're surrendering to win, not surrendering to lose. And that's a win. And it took a long time for me to realize that. So, you know, part of part of my recovery was getting over myself and my thing that I was losing when in the end I've won. You know, that's, that is common amongst athletes. And I, I do have a, I have a lot of athletes that, that I see. I'm, I'm one of the NBA addiction docs and it's a, it's a huge problem. Also some Olympic athletes and their careers over at 20, 21, 22. And all of a sudden the thing that gave them drive that got them up in the morning, single-minded where everything made sense, where you found flow, right? Where you were in the zone, so to speak is gone. And you know, you have loving people around you, you have a family, you have you have a great mind, but that, yeah, you do need to reinvent yourself. I mean, one of the, that's one of the main things I do when I work with, with these players is meaning and purpose. And like you, you express some great vulnerability there, which is probably a new thing too, because, you know, tough guys, we don't talk about our feelings, but George has it. Julie has it. I have it. I know, you know, a lot of, you know, men and women in recovery, like we do, we're imperfect, you know, and there's times where we have crises, like, is this really all there is? Or, you know, what am I doing with my life? And, and I, and I think that's great that you admit that you can admit that. It is. And it's, it's, you know, we're, we're placed on this earth for, for a reason. Uh, I believe that. And I, I do believe that God put me here with the ability to play baseball. That's one thing, but that was not what my intention was for him. His intention was for me to, I guess, to be an alcoholic and to try and help others and to show other people that this is real it doesn't matter what my Hall of Fame stats are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm still as vulnerable as any, anyone to this disease. And, and that's what I want to tell me. It's okay. And there is hope. And there is hope that we can recover from this. You know, everybody always goes back to like, if you have cancer, you get that treated. Um, you can do all that. But sometimes you're, you die, you know, the, even with the treatment, right. at least with, with alcoholism or addiction, if we treat this and get sober, we have a chance to live a great life. And it's it, what a gift that is for all the stuff that I put my body through. What would I put my family through that? I still got a chance by making a living amend every single day to go out and be the best possible person I can be. Dude, that's awesome. George, don't you love his, his fire, his passion? Like, yeah, I mean, like you got it, you got, it. you didn't always get it. You know, there are times in and out of recovery where it's like, damn, that guy is so awesome. Sober. You know, it's like, if only he knew that about himself, right? But, you know, I've seen Jeff over those seven years. And what's been a blessing and a joy for me is to see his desire to help others and his willingness to get out of his own way. And uh, it's been a beautiful uh, transformation. You know, it's like, I think when you have success in certain areas and then you're humbled by this disease, it's hard to let go. I mean, like, shit, I've been successful in other areas. Why can't I be successful in this? And, and to realize, like you said, to surrender to win, to make a difference, not only in your life, but man, the lives of everybody around you change because we're different people. And man, people love that. It's like, I talked to Jeff, but I never talked to him about baseball because it's not important to me. It's more important to what he, who he is. But I obviously I know who he is from baseball aspects, but Anytime I've dealt with anybody that's been a celebrity or a sports figure, I want them to be comfortable to not talk about what everybody wants to talk to them about. Or, you know, whatever It's like the first time we ever had an NFL football quarterback that was going to come to our rehab center man, the news was in the parking lot waiting for him. You know, it's like and I had to talk to the people that were there and I said, do you want to help somebody? Then I don't want you to ever talk about his career until he brings it up. I want you to talk about his alcoholism and about him as a person. That's if you want to care about him. If you want to hurt him, talk about that first and you'll, you'll lose his ability to be real and to be human and to make a difference in his life. 
Treat them like you treat anybody who walks in the store. Treat them unconditionally. And so it was a great learning lesson. I've had to fire people because they want to go ask for an autograph. You know, and I was like, that's not why they're here or their family members, celebrity. And, they, you know, they they just don't think of how, the impact that that's not why we're dealing with life and death. And so to see Jeff make it to this point and now to make a difference, like yesterday, he was the uh, chairman or the uh, I forgot. What do we what do we call you? The host of the Archway Academy <laughs> Golf tournament. A lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't friendly. So he was a host, but it wasn't friendly. So he, he, you know, just being a part of that tournament made a difference for people that were there. I mean, it is like, wow, Jeff's Jeff's signing off on this. So my recovery, my being involved with Archways, making a difference, and and they feel good about it. And that's what, to me, a celebrity or a person of any kind of success, if they can be sober they have a larger microphone than maybe the guy who's just a, you know, off the street alcoholic that may not have had a career, but more importantly, we have to treat them humanly and that they're not above us or below us. And that, and Jeff's always been that way. In fact, I think Jeff's so humble when he shares that his, his knowledge is so strong that people go like, like, it's almost like, I don't know if y'all too young for EF Hutton, but they used to have this commercial called EF Hutton where, when EF Hutton talks, everybody stops and listens. And that's how that's how it is when Jeff shares. So thank you, Jeff, for being here and being willing to, to well, talk about, you know, recovery and how it's affected your life. Well, I appreciate that. And, and you know, George, I, I make an effort when I share in meetings. I try never to talk about what I did for a living. You know, most people know what I did for a living. I try not to bring that up unless it's something that's very valuable for the conversation. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, what the gift of it at times, I remember being in a Saturday post oak meeting at 8.30 and I, I left and there's a kid in the, in the room and he comes up to me, he goes, oh my God. He goes, what are you doing here, Jeff? I went, <laughs> the same shit you're doing here. <laughs> I said, it doesn't matter who I, I said, I'm trying to get sober just like you are, my friend. And awesome. you know, that, that's good. You know, when you hear kids do that, because it, it's just another reinforcement of how, it doesn't matter who you are. And we go through this and, you know, you want to get humbled, go ahead and be one of us. But that being said, the gift that it gives you far outweighs the shame that that you have when you first get sober. And then as George, with your numbers of years in sobriety, it's just, it's such a gift that when you walk into a room, when you first get there, you hear the words, grateful alcoholic. And the first words out of your mouth or underneath your breath, are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) I am not grateful to be. And now I get it. And I really do. And uh, it's been such a gift for me. And I I am so grateful for that. Absolutely. So three things come up. Three things come up. One is it was a blessing that I wasn't at the Archway Golf Tournament because I keep score by sleeves of balls per hole. (laughs) That's just kind of that's an aside. The second thing is we know that if we put somebody who's successful like you in front of teenagers and we're, and you say, don't use, and we've done, we've known from studies, like what doesn't work They're They're like, if they hear your story of success and then debauchery and then now success, they're like, I want that trajectory of my life. But if we march, so that's why, like, if I take a, if I take a Jeff Bagwell to a talk, I also bring the toothless homeless guy. Because the, the chances are so slim that you're going to be a Jeff Bagwell or even like not you particularly, but like getting into uh, getting into any professional sports profession is, is like so minuscule. But then if you have addiction as that, the chances are also small. You're going to be in recovery and do well. We know we, we've lost Caminetti. We've lost so many great people to this friggin disease. And, and so, like, I guess that kind of poses a question, Jeff, like what? What are you careful to do when you, when you speak to to kids and to very impressionable people? You know, that, it, it's such a great question because one more story. So I led a, I think it's contractors meeting on Monday night. And uh, it was the first time I really ventured out of my little zone of recovery uh, guys. And I led it. And then I'm looking as I'm about the meetings about to start. And there's about 15 kids that, that come up and they're sitting in the back against the wall. And I'm talking about acceptance and all that kind of stuff. And my, the entire time as I'm talking, I'm thinking about these kids and I'm going, 
what a what a chore it is or what a what a mountain that's so hard to climb thinking that I got to be sober for the rest of my life and I'm 15 years old. And one who can speak about this the most probably is George. I believe George got you got sober at 19, George. 19, yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking say say it's George and I'm sitting there going, how the heck do you get <laughs> how do you how do you wrap your mind around this? At 42 when I started this, I couldn't wrap myself around it then. And I've already done a whole bunch of stuff. Um, imagine that young. So I asked a few people around the program, men that I respect. I said, I kept going, what do I say to these kids? I know they know wh who I am. And some of them don't because they're 15. I mean, I retired 15 years ago. <laughs> but I'm sitting there going, what, what is the first thing I say? And the, I think what I've come up with with me is I kind of look at them and go, how's your life right now? How's it going for you? <laughs> and to a T, every one of these kids says, man, it's horrible. And I remember I called on two kids at the end just because I couldn't help myself. And we talk about one day at a time and all that. And this kid goes, you know, Jeff, it's more like 10 minutes at a time, 30 minutes at a time. And it just blew my doors off. And I'm like, damn, you know, what, what, what can we do? Now, we talked about Archway. Archway is a chance for kids to have a regular life in an atmosphere of school with other people in the same program that hopefully will keep them sober for the rest of their lives, or at least to get them understand where their life can go if we don't do this stuff. And that's another impactful thing to see how many kids in Archway, you know, have tried to kill themselves. And, you know, that's real stuff for kids. And damn, man, I'm 52 years old now. And I'm like, I'm thinking, what if somebody told me this when I was 18 years old, 17 years old? Like, dude, you got a real bad problem. You know, you're either going to go to jail or you got to go to rehab. That could be court ordered or whatever it is. What a challenge it must be for them. And, and I think for, for me and everybody in the community, all we want to do is help because nobody wants anybody else to have to go through something like we've gone through already. And especially young kids, because what a challenge. I mean, we it's hard enough for us, never mind somebody that young. So, I mean, that's very important to me with the kids. And that's why the kids are very important to me in this program. Hey, Jeff, how is your life today? It's absolutely, it's wonderful. But that being said, as we say, my my life is wonderful. That's another thing. Life still goes on. Yep. You know, I got five kids. You know how <laughs> my life is. George got six. <laughs> we got problems all over the place. We got problems. <laughs> but, isn't it, but isn't it amazing, though, that you can actually be the adult in the room now? Mm -hmm. when, I, when I was more or less the drunk or the child in the room. Mm -hmm. um, so my life, you know, and I t this is my, my big statement about that is... If the way my life is now and the person that I think I am, if the only way that, that I can have what I have now is to give up drinking, I can do that. Or at least I could try. And then, you know, I'm doing my best I can right now. But that, that's, worth the, that's worth the sacrifice if you consider that a sacrifice just to not drink anymore. Yeah. So what, what came up for me also, the third thing to actually just maybe piggyback on it was Eric Clapton's in recovery. And, I you know, know, you know that story. so he, yeah, he, it, Clapton is God it was written on graffiti and he sells out. He's amazing. And he said, like, you know, I've sold out Wimberley Stadium, but the most powerful I've ever felt when I was on my knees saying, hello, my name is Eric and I'm an alcoholic. And, yeah. and I heard you say that sentiment exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's just like, we're, you know, we all put on our pants the same way. Some of us pants, they're like, you know, a little bit longer than people like me, but so what, you know, we, we got today. You know what the thing that's so wonderful though. And I know like, when you meet somebody in recovery, somebody you never met before ever, automatically you become brothers. You know what I mean? It's just the most amazing feeling because we know what it's like to go through crap. And it's it's such a beautiful thing. And, you know, I was laughing to myself in my Hall of Fame speech. I said, I would wonder if in my speech, if I went, thank you, thank you. Hey, I'm Jeff. I'm an alcoholic. And I would die to have seen Listen to here. Hey, Jeff, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I, I'm sorry, but I didn't have the nuts to do that. <laughs> you would have heard some people say yeah, that. Sure. I just, it's just, it's amazing. Just the brotherhood and, and I'll say brotherhood. I'll, I'll say, you know, what do you call it, George? Tell me. Fellowship. 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 I don't <laughs> I was be biased to the women. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm trying not to because women are a big part of my life too. And yeah. especially having four girls, they've really helped me out. with a lot of that. <laughs> What do you do to keep yourself busy? Like what's your, what's your day like? I'm waiting for these ungrateful kids to come home here in a second. <laughs> and then uh, I do do some stuff with the Astros, which is very nice. And, you know, they know, they know what I am and uh, which is, which is a blessing. Uh, my owner is very versed in addiction, alcoholic community. So he, he understands it. 
Um, but been, it's wonderful. And it's they've given me an opportunity to come back into the organization and, and start to make a difference in what we're trying to do. So that, that's a big part of my life. And, you know, I tell I laugh. I say, you know, there's only a few things. I'm two things I'm good at. And this, I said, I, I'm good at baseball and I'm really good at screwing up. <laughs> <laughs> so I try and I try and stay the other the other way with the uh, good in baseball. All right. And uh, this is a lightning round. So I'm going to ask you 10 questions. I want you just to whatever pops in your head. What is your favorite word? Grateful. What's your least favorite word? Word? One word? <laughs> <laughs> Can I? Uh, it's usually a question from my kids. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that one. Go ahead, give me another one. Yeah, you, you've met my three kids. I need, I want, and I have to have. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just got one before I got on. <laughs> so what, what revs you up the most? Kids. What turns you off the most? Players. What sound or noise do you love? My wife's voice. What sound or noise do you hate? My voice. <laughs> <laughs> Whiny kids. <laughs> Dude, I'm so with you. I won't even listen to this podcast. I don't, I hate my voice too. What's your favorite curse word? See, uh, and that, see, that was part of the ones I was going to say earlier. So I'm not, I'd probably say the mo- most, I'd probably say shit. So dropping the S bomb. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I say a bunch. I- I'm awful. <laughs> All right. So if you, if you couldn't play ball and you had to choose another profession, what do you think you'd like to try? As you know, growing up, so you have a whole new chance, but you're not allowed to be an athlete. What would you do? Not allowed to be an athlete. Well, I was going to school. I uh, was in business and marketing, but you know that's just kind of something I thought. I, I don't know what I would want to be. My mother was a policeman, but I don't think I wanted to be a policeman, police woman, whatever you want to call them now. Hey, you per- can be whatever you want, however you identified. I, I don't know. You know what? I, I've always loved sports, and I always I know it wasn't going to be a dishwasher at Friendlies. I know that <laughs> <laughs> because back then dishwashers aren't what they are right now. <laughs> That's right. What profession would you not like to do? Dishwasher in front of me. I'm sorry. I'll never get over that. It's something I can never get. <laughs> trauma. Well, back in those days, the, you put them in a the thing and you, you put them down. And then when it wasn't like it was, an, you pull it back up and the steam comes straight into your face. I did that. <laughs> oh, no. Yes, yeah, so I got a funny story. I was working at Spaghetti Warehouse in college mm-hmm. and we had these like staff meetings every month. And one month, you know, they do the, employee of the employee of the month. So I got employee of the month, nice. but well, so the general manager is like, so Jason's getting this because, you know, I know you guys hate that birthday song, but whenever there's a birthday, he's always there singing and he buzzes the table. And you know why? Cause I love the cake that we had. It was this Pepper's farm, <laughs> vanilla, vanilla. So whatever they had, it's not, not I would be with the dishwashers <laughs> eating yeah, that makes sense. the tables to get dibs on the cake. I didn't give a shit about the song. <laughs> I know, but that's kind of like what I was after parties in the morning, cleaning <laughs> up all the drinks. <laughs> so was left. I, I, yeah, I drink it all before I put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> I did that with drinks. But, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, last question. You get to heaven. What do you want God to say at the pearly gates? What do I want him to say? Nice job. Awesome. All right, I'm done. I'm going to drop my mic. I'll let George and Julie hit you. All right. <laughs> well, George, I'm going to do the positive intervention at the end. So what do you have as a, as a host today for Jeff? Jeff, I'd just like to know, like, what, you know, put me on the spot about a question, but I think you've kind of answered it, but what, what would your legacy be like? Like from now on, not post-retirement, what would you like to be known for? I think that's probably the, um, the best question you could ask. And I've told people this a lot. People ask me all the time, what, do you, what about your legacy? How do you want it to look at? And they assume that I'm going to talk about baseball. Mm-hmm. And as I said before, baseball is just my job. My legacy is I want to be the best possible father I can be and the best possible husband I can be. With all the stuff that I've done wrong in my past that I have, I have battled through, one of the toughest things that you can battle, came out the other side as I sit here today. And I'm a person that, generally cares more about others than I do about myself, but also cares enough about myself to project something positive. And that includes my family, the fellowship, whoever it is um, that I've made a difference in somebody's life. I've told my kids a lot. I said, you know, if you can go through life and at the end of your life, you know that you've helped somebody else, not your family, not, you know, not your kids, not your mother and father, all that kind of stuff, but you've helped somebody else's life to be better then you've done something good. You know, and, and and it can be little small things. Saying hello to the person that's bagging your 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 groceries, who's having a bad day. To understand that people people got shit, you know. And no matter who you are, and and it's 
you're just somebody that's caring for others. And that, that, that would be, that would be my legacy. He cared about others. That would be great. Thanks for sharing that. What I heard a lot, Jeff, was kindness coming out. And so that's what I heard when you were talking. And I just appreciate you being so vulnerable with us today. We do positive interventions at Positive Recovery Centers with our clients, with our staff. And today we get to do it with you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and read it. And I might ask everyone on the call questions about it. The quote of the day was by John Maxwell. And it's, life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Human beings create stories from events that happen in the world. We don't live in one reality, but in the strands weave together in these stories. Judgments, fears, hopes, attitudes, and perceptions impact the gist of every story. Other animals react to stimuli only and do not make up stories about those stimuli. For example, when a dog barks when it hears a noise, it doesn't bark when it feels the noise is someone from someone who shouldn't be making the noise. Human beings are the only animals who react to the meanings of stimuli, which of course we fabricate most of the time. Moreover, human beings believe their stories are true. What really happens makes up only a small percentage of reality. What we tell ourselves happened which memories and moods significantly influence determines a much larger percentage. The same event can impact you in vastly different ways based solely on your storytelling. Life is ambiguous. Fortunately, you can choose to use that to your advantage. Struggles and hardships will happen. No one leads a pain-free existence. So for the positive intervention, we were strengthening our abilities as the positive narrator of our own story. If possible, You can bring in a trusted accountability partner for this activity to help you complete today's positive intervention as a listener. So to start, we were hoping that you would vividly recall a particularly vexing, negative, or challenging time in your past as a positive narrator of your own story. Retell that experience to your listening accountability partner by being true. With true, T stands for telling the best possible story R for realistically framing the story, U for using a positive storyteller viewpoint, and E for ending the story with optimism. So I think what, uh, just to kind of summarize that for our listeners and for everybody is that, you know, when we're talking about something that happened to us, it's hardly ever the truth about what really happened. We throw in all kinds of our, our thoughts, our perceptions, our feelings, and it wasn't really true. It wasn't really based on fact. We're creating the story. And so, um, Jeff, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at this before today. I actually um, did. I'm, I'm proud of myself. I actually did read that. I saw the true part, everything that you wrote down there. I, you know, I, I, immediate, my immediate thought when you started talking about this, I, was, I said, what an what a interesting thing you just said in the world that we live in right now, mm-hmm. where politics and news is all about how you look at stuff and how you react to them. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing in the world is... Everybody seems to re- react either 100% up or 100% down. There's no middle ground, and that's what we struggle in. As far as a story, I mean, my recovery is that story. Mm-hmm. And I think the most important thing is what you said. If we say true, you can't recover if you're not honest. First and foremost, you have to be honest with yourself and God. That is the most important thing. Because God knows when you're freaking lying, okay? So you can't fool him. And then it becomes becoming vulnerable and being honest. Like my wife knows all my shit, excuse my language. Like she knows what I did beforehand, which got me to a little bit where I am now. And my kids know everything. And that is the biggest freeing thing in the world where you walk around with nothing on your back. There is no gorilla on my back. And I don't worry about anybody walking up behind me and doing it because I'm honest about it. And only you can tell the right story. You know, there's so much to my story is, oh, yeah, I could say that, you know, I took 20, 13 year olds to Taylor Swift and I fell down over a chair. That's a real story that really happened. And now I could take 20 kids to the tell and be perfectly fine and sit there and be normal. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, there, there's there's so much there's so much things that happen in my life. I, I'll tell you, I don't know if this makes sense. But I'm going to tell you guys a story anyway. My one of my daughters has a friend that got addicted to a drug. She's lying, 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 this girl. And they're all all the friends are getting mad at this girl. And so I sat her down and she's they're like, oh, I'm done with her. We're all done with her. And I said, OK, listen. So I sit her down and said, hey, here's the deal. Do you remember looking at your father for those seven years? 
not the three years that I've been sober, but the seven years, do you remember looking at, and I came out of this. I said, you of anybody know more than, than anyone here. Cause you've lived this. Here's your options. You either forget you ever known her or show her love and know that that's not her. And that will dictate her outcome as well as yours. Mm-hmm. And those stuff like that, to be honest, and let her to understand those kind of things generally is going to give a good reaction to it. Mm-hmm. And she's going to make that adjustment saying, hey, man, this is not who she is. She's just addicted to this stuff. So mm-hmm. we got to help her. I don't know if that, that that makes sense in the content, but, but what I'm saying is if you be honest and you tell people the real truth and let them decide on which way to go, generally, I believe people will go the right way. You know, mm-hmm. you can try and spin the truth as much as you want, but if you know the truth, there's no escaping it. And for it's our, our politics and all that kind of stuff, that's frustrating because the truth is the truth. And we try and stem it all different ways mm-hmm. to ever suit our own needs. But the truth, as they say, will set you free. And that's how mm-hmm. I try and live by it. Excellent. Thanks yeah. for sharing that story. I don't know if that meant anything, but yeah. it meant a lot. It was, it was huge. It was rich. It did. Like, I, I'm with you. Like, I did so many things during my active addiction that when I say them, I'm not proud of them. It's so, just because I'm honest, it doesn't mean it, it, it actually makes me feel like gross. You know, I did similar things like falling down and like, God, just so embarrassing. And, and, and so when I tell my story, I like to just kind of, okay, I got sober and now, but mm-hmm. people like, people like to hear, but I don't like to say it. And it's, you know, I, I think this positive intervention, it's how we tell ourselves stories that could either give us energy or detract. So let me give you an example. I, I was given a big talk at Methodist Hospital, and my biggest fear is speaking in front of doctors. I'm a doctor, but they scare me. I, I could talk in front of a thousand any other type of person, but man, my inner critic is like, you're a fraud, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing. Like anybody else, they don't really know, but doctors, I for some reason, I'm really judged. So I was scared, and I, I was going to do the best job ever, and I got this new program that would make animation, and it would be super funny. I would be the best, but... What happens was, is that I was giving the talk and I, and I got lost because the computer couldn't keep up with all the animations. And it was like, I fucking failed. I failed bad. And I, I usually get, you can ask George and Julie, like, you know, it's not like I, you know, I, I'm a little better than average a lot of times. Like, I feel like you know, I, I can give good talks, but man, I just felt so bad. So for a while, I was telling myself the story that, see, that confirms that you're a fraud, you're an idiot. Mm-hmm. And then I shared it with people and I got good feedback and so the truth is, I would really try too hard to impress. I did fail. Like that, yeah, I failed. But it doesn't mean that I'm a fraud and I don't belong. It just means, hey, you got to change how you prepare and what your intention is. And now my intention is to educate. And, and I do love pe- making people laugh, but I'm not going to like go overboard anymore. And it's so much, there's no stress. Like, you know what? I'm going to give a good talk. And if you don't, I don't have to be the best thing you've ever seen in your life. That's, I think, the nature of this sort of like, like, you know, I, I could live in that shit and then I could never talk again. I'd be afraid of getting up. That's the truth. Yeah. I was at that and he was nowhere near as bad as he thought. He was. <laughs> that is for sure. But there's no doubt about it. That's the story he was telling yourself, himself. It was not a fact. Isn't that the so, way it goes, though? We yeah. always support it. Yeah, I'm going to tell a quick story. I'm going to embarrass George. So Uh-oh. George is, a, is an amazing businessman. We all know this already about George. And so I've worked with George for a really long time now, but very, very early on in my career working with George. And he probably won't even remember the story, but we had just opened up a treatment center out in the hill country and I was driving back and forth and I got really tired on the drive back. So I was like, I'm so tired. I have to pull over. I want to, I can't make it all the way back to Houston because I even live an hour further than Houston. So I'm going to pull him and stay at a hotel. And I'm like, but I'm going to have to expense this. And I'm not really sure what he's going to say about me pulling over. Like, you should have been able to make it home. <laughs> so I stayed at a relatively inexpensive, like, I think it was like a Motel 6 even. And I'm blushing now for the story that I told myself. Okay. So stayed at the hotel, slept, got up probably at like 5 o'clock so I could make it to work on time. You know, I didn't say anything. I put in my expense report. A week went by and George calls me to his office. And um, the whole way over, I had to walk to the green building, is what we were referring to it at. And I'm like, if he says, what about me expensing that stupid Motel 6, I'm going to be pissed. And oh my God, I can't believe he's going to call me out on this. And I was brought to his office to talk about my hotel. And what George said to me is, Julie, when you're traveling, please don't stay in a Motel 6 because I don't feel like that's safe for you. 
because the doors are from the outside in. Stay in a hotel that you have to go up an elevator in. And I was trying to save the company money, which I probably didn't need to do. But I had made up this story walking over that I was going to give him a rash of shit if he <laughs> dare told me anything about that. We do, and we said, we do. It was beautiful what he said. And that was, take care of yourself and be safe. And so, yeah, wow, thank God. I was like, I did confront her. <laughs> I'm glad I said that. <laughs> yeah. But those are the stories we create stories all the time, and we forget what the facts are, or, or we do that. And our clients, our patients here at Positive Recovery do that also. And so, it's and they, they do it in the rooms. And so, it's guys like you that help people say, wait a minute. Is that what really happened? Or let's take a look at really happened. And how did you, how did you respond to what happened? Right? Like those are so important. So thanks for uh, playing along. George, do you have a story that you want to share? Before um, we I got so many stories, but I, I just, I love, I think a lot of us are minimizers or maximizers, especially in marriage. And so you got to figure out what the middle is and what reality is. Exactly. Now, my story is kind of back what you were talking about. So early in my career, our turnover was high and, you know, the culture wasn't what I'd want it to be, you know, and then we got this great book, Delivering Happiness, that led to Dr. Parr's creating positive recovery and the culture change and we won best place to work. But for a long time before I got that award, even when it was doing better, I still felt like, man, I'm not good at this. I'm, I'm not good at creating culture and mission statement and all that stuff. And then it's like, so weird because once I got the award, it's like that whole pressure on my shoulders went away. And, and then I, I think I've done a better job creating culture because I wasn't so worried about it. Kind of like you with your speech, you know, that you, Julie said was great. But in your mind, you're like, God, what a dumbass. Why did I do this focus on human resource better or, you know, come up with the value statements or mission statements and all those things. So that was my story is like how to reframe that. Yes, I am a good leader. And I've done the best I could even back then when I didn't know what I was necessarily doing like I do now. So thank you. Yeah, man, you you were. I'd, I'd follow you anywhere. You know that. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, it's great working for you. And so, Jeff, the uh, that intervention you got came out of this book, which we're going to send you. But yeah, thank you so much for taking the time thank and, you. and My pleasure. being present with us and being an example for others. Yes, uh, absolutely. Really thank you, Jeff. How you guys got it. Appreciate so it great. so much. All right. Signing off. Thank you guys. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Positive Recovery MD. Don't forget to visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to get your daily positive intervention sent straight to your inbox. Be sure to subscribe to Positive Recovery MD on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts to receive an automatic download when a new episode drops. And as always, if you or someone you know needs help, visit PositiveRecovery.com or call 877-4-SOBRIETY, which is 877-476-2743. We are here to help.